Welcome to the Quiet Corner Bedtime Stories. I'm Annie, and along with my co-host Eamon, we're here to share our favourite classic stories, accompanied by soothing music, to help you relax, unwind, and drift off into a peaceful night's sleep. If you enjoy our stories, please like, subscribe, and leave a rating or review on your favourite podcast platform. You can also support us on Lenny FM along with some of your other favourite podcasts or make a donation to ko-fi, K-O-F-I dot com so we can continue to share these classic stories with you all. Thank you for all your support and sweet dreams. Tonight I'll be reading the final two chapters from Eight Cousins. Thank you to everyone who has listened to this story, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have sharing it with you. For the remainder of December, we will be reading some Christmas stories, and then in January, we'll continue with Jane Eyre and some short stories by various authors. Now it's time to relax. Close your eyes and forget about all all your worries from the day as you snuggle up and listen to tonight's story. Chapter 23 Peacemaking Steve, I want you to tell me something, said Rose to Dandy, who was making faces at himself in the glass while he waited for an answer to the note he had brought from his mother to Aunt Plenty. Perhaps I will, and perhaps I won't. What is it? Have Arch and Charlie quarrelled? Dare say, we fellows are always having little rows, you know. I do believe a sty is coming on my starboard eye. And Steve affected to be absorbed in a survey of his yellow lashes. No, that won't do. I want to know all about it for I'm sure something more serious than a little row is in the matter. Come, please tell me, Stevie, there's a dear. Botheration, you don't want me to turn tell-tale, do you? Growled Steve, pulling his top knot as he always did when perplexed. Yes, I do, was Rose's decided answer, for she saw from his manner that she was right and determined to have the secret out of him if coaxing would do it. I don't wish you to tell things to everyone, of course, but to me you may, and you must, because I have a right to know. You boys need somebody to look after you, and I'm going to do it, for girls are nice peacemakers and know how to manage people. Uncle said so, and he is never wrong. Steve was about to indulge in a derisive hoot at the idea of her looking after them, but a sudden thought restrained him and suggested a way in which he could satisfy Rose and better himself at the same time. What will you give me if I tell you every bit about it? he asked, with a sudden red in his cheeks and an uneasy look in his eyes, for he was half ashamed of the proposition. What do you want? and Rose looked up, rather surprised at his question. I'd like to borrow some money. I shouldn't think of asking you. Only Mac never has a cent since he's set up his old chemical shop, where he'll blow himself to bits some day, and you and Uncle will have the fun of putting him together again. And Steve tried to look as if the idea amused him. I'll lend it to you with pleasure, so tell away said Rose, bound to get at the secret. Evidently much relieved by the promise, Steve set his top knot cheerfully erect again and briefly stated the case. As you say, it's all right to tell you, but don't let the boys know I blabbed, or Prince will take my head off. You see, Archie doesn't like some of the fellows Charlie goes with. That makes Prince mad and he holds on just to plague Arch. So they don't speak to each other, if they can help it, and that's the row. Are those boys bad? 
asked Rose anxiously. Guess not, only rather wild. They are older than our fellows, but they like Prince. He's such a jolly boy, sings so well, dances, jigs and breakdowns, you know, and plays any game that's going. He beat Morse at billiards, and that's something to brag of, for Morse thinks he knows everything. I saw the match, and it was great fun. Steve got quite excited over the prowess of Charlie, whom he admired immensely and tried to imitate. Rose did not know half the danger of such gifts and tastes as Charlie's, but felt that something must be wrong if Archie disapproved. If Prince likes any billiard-playing boy better than Archie, I don't think much of his sense, she said severely. Of course he doesn't, but you see, Charlie and Arch are both as proud as they can be and won't give in. I suppose Arch is right, but I don't blame Charlie a bit for liking to be with the others sometimes. They are such a jolly set. And Steve shook his head morally even while his eye twinkled over the memory of some of the exploits of the jolly set. Oh dear me, sighed Rose. I don't see what I can do about it, but I wish the boys would make up, for Prince can't come to any harm with Archie. He's so good and sensible. That's the trouble. Arch preaches, and Prince won't stand it. He told Arch he was a prig and a parson, and Arch told him he wasn't a gentleman. My boots, weren't they both mad, though? I thought for a minute they'd pitch into each other and have it out. Wish they had, and not gone stalking round stiff and glum ever since. Mac and I settle our rows with a bat or so over the head, and then we are all right. What droll things boys are, she said, with a mixture of admiration and perplexity in her face, which Steve accepted as a compliment. We are a pretty clever invention, miss, and you can't get on without us, he answered, with his nose in the air. Then taking a sudden plunge into business, he added, How about that bit of money you were going to lend me? I've told, now you pay up. Of course I will. How much do you want? And Rose pulled out her purse. Could you spare five dollars? I want to pay a little debt of honour that is rather pressing. And Steve put on a mannish air that was comical to see. Aren't all debts honourable? asked innocent Rose. Yes, of course, but this is a bet I made, and it ought to be settled up at once, began Steve finding it awkward to explain. Oh, don't bet, it's not right, and I know your father wouldn't like it. Promise you won't do so again. Please promise. And Rose held fast the hand into which she had just put the money. Well, I won't, it's worried me a great deal, but I was joked into it. Much obliged, cousin, I'm all right now. And Steve departed hastily. Having decided to be a peacemaker, Rose waited for an opportunity, and very soon it came. She was spending the day with Aunt Clara, who had been entertaining some young guests, and invited Rose to meet them, for she thought it high time her niece conquered her bashfulness and saw a little of society. Dinner was over, and everyone had gone. Aunt Clara was resting before going out to an evening party, and Rose was waiting for Charlie to come to take her home. She sat alone in the elegant drawing room, feeling particularly nice and pretty, for she had her best frock on, and a tea rosebud in her sash, like the beautiful Miss Van Tassel whom everyone admired. She had spread out her little skirts to the best advantage, and leaning back in a luxurious chair, sat admiring her own feet in new slippers with rosettes almost as big as dahlias. Presently Charlie came lounging in, looking rather sleepy and queer, Rose thought. 
On seeing her, however, he roused up and said with a smile that ended in a gape, I thought you were with mother, so I took forty winks after I got those girls off. Now I'm at your service, Rosamunda, whenever you like. You look as if your head ached. If it does, don't mind me. I'm not afraid to run home alone. It's so early, answered Rose, observing the flushed cheeks and heavy eyes of her cousin. I think I see myself letting you do it. Champagne always makes my head ache, but the air will set me up. Why do you drink it then? asked Rose anxiously. Can't help it when I'm host. Now, don't you begin to lecture. I've had enough of Archie's old-fashioned notions, and I don't want any more. Charlie's tone was decidedly cross, and his whole manner so unlike his usual merry and good nature that Rose felt crushed and answered meekly, I wasn't going to lecture. Only, when people like other people, they can't bear to see them suffer. That brought Charlie round at once for Rose's lips trembled a little, though she tried to hide it by smelling the flower she pulled from her sash. I'm a regular bear, and I beg your pardon for being so cross, Rosie, he said in the old frank way that was so winning. I wish you'd beg Archie's too, and be good friends again. You never were cross when he was your chum, Rose said looking up at him as he bent toward her from the low chimney piece where he had been leaning his elbows. In an instant he stood as stiff and straight as a ramrod, and the heavy eyes kindled with an angry spark as he said in his high and mighty manner, You'd better not meddle with what you don't understand, cousin. But I do understand, and it troubles me very much to see you so cold and stiff to each other. You always used to be together, and now you hardly speak. You are so ready to beg my pardon. I don't see why you can't beg Archie's if you are in the wrong. I'm not. This was so short and sharp that Rose started, and Charlie added in a calmer but still very haughty tone. A gentleman always begs pardon when he has been rude to a lady but one man doesn't apologise to another man who has insulted him. Oh my heart, what a pepper pot, thought Rose, and hoping to make him laugh, she added slyly, I was not talking about men, but boys, and one of them a prince who ought to set a good example to his subjects. But Charlie would not relent, and tried to turn the subject by saying gravely, as he unfastened the little gold ring from his watch guard. I've broken my word, so I want to give this back and free you from the bargain. I'm sorry, but I think it a foolish promise and don't intend to keep it. Choose a pair of earrings to suit yourself as my forfeit. You have a right to wear them now. No, I can only wear one, and that is no use, for Archie will keep his word, I'm sure. Rose was so mortified and grieved at this downfall of her hopes that she spoke sharply and would not take the ring the deserter offered her. He shrugged his shoulders and threw it into her lap, trying to look cool and careless, but failing entirely, for he was ashamed of himself and out of sorts generally. Rose wanted to cry, but pride would not let her and being very angry, she relieved herself by talk instead of tears. Looking pale and excited, she rose out of her chair, cast away the ring, and said in a voice that she vainly tried to keep steady, You are not at all the boy I thought you were, and I don't respect you one bit. I've tried to help you be good, but you won't let me, and I shall not try any more. You talk a great deal about being a gentleman, but you are not, for you've broken your word, and I can never trust you again. I don't wish you to go home with me. I'd rather have Mary. Good night. And with that last dreadful blow, 
Rose walked out of the room, leaving Charlie as much astonished as if one of his pet pigeons had flown in his face and pecked at him. She was so seldom angry that when her temper did get the better of her, it made a deep impression on the lads, for it was generally a righteous sort of indignation at some injustice or wrongdoing, not childish passion. Her little thunderstorm cleared off in a sob or two as she put on her things in the entry closet, and when she emerged, she looked rather brighter for the shower. A hasty good night to Aunt Clara, now under the hands of the hairdresser, and then she crept down to find Mary, the maid, and Rose slipped away by the back door, flattering herself that she had escaped the awkwardness of having Charlie for escort. There she was mistaken, however, for the gate had hardly closed behind her when a well-known tramp was heard, and the prince was beside her, saying in a tone of penitent politeness that banished Rose's wrath like magic. You needn't speak to me if you don't choose, but I must see you safely home, cousin. She turned at once, put out her hand, and answered heartily. I was the cross one. Please forgive me, and let's be friends again. Now that was better than a dozen sermons on the beauty of forgiveness, and did Charlie more good, for it showed him how sweet humility was, and proved that Rose practised as she preached. He shook the hand warmly, then drew it through his arm and said, as if anxious to recover the good opinion with the loss of which he had been threatened. Look here, Rosie, I've put the ring back and I'm going to try again, but you don't know how hard it is to stand being laughed at. Yes, I do. Annabel plagues me every time I see her, because I don't wear earrings after all the trouble I had getting ready for them. Ah, but her twaddle isn't half as bad as the chafing I get. It takes a deal of pluck to hold out when you are told you are tied to an apron string and all that sort of thing, sighed Charlie. I thought you had a deal of pluck, as you call it. The boys all say you were the bravest of the seven, said Rose. So I am, about some things, but I cannot bear to be laughed at. It is hard, but if one is right, won't that make it easier? Not to me. It might be to a pious parson like Arch. Please don't call him names. I guess he has what is called moral courage, and you physical courage. Uncle explain the difference to me. And moral is the best, though often it doesn't look so, said Rose thoughtfully. Charlie didn't like that, and answered quickly, I don't believe he'd stand it any better than I do if he had those fellows at him. Perhaps that's why he keeps out of their way and wants you to. Rose had him there, and Charlie felt it, but he would not give in just yet, though he was going fast, for somehow he seemed to see things clearer in the dark than in the light and found it very easy to be confidential when it was only Rose. If he were my brother now, he'd have some right to interfere, began Charlie in an injured tone. I wish he were, cried Rose. So do I, answered Charlie, and then they both laughed at his inconsistency. The laugh did them good, and when Prince spoke again, it was in a different tone, Pensive, not proud, nor perverse. You see, it's hard upon me that I have no brothers and sisters. The others are better off and needn't go abroad for chums if they don't like. I am all alone, and I'd be thankful even for a little sister. Rose thought that very pathetic, and overlooking the uncomplimentary word even in that last sentence, she said with a timid sort of earnestness that conquered her cousin at once. Play I am a little sister. I know I'm silly, 
but perhaps I'm better than nothing, and I'd dearly love to do it. So should I, and we will, for you are not silly, my dear, but a very sensible girl, we all think, and I'm proud to have you for a sister, there now. And Charlie looked down at the curly head bobbing along beside him with real affection. Rose gave a skip of pleasure and laid one sealskin mitten over the other on his arm as she said happily, That's so nice of you. Now you needn't be lonely any more, and I'll try to fill Archie's place till he comes back, for I know he will as soon as you let him. Well, I don't mind telling you that while he was my mate, I never missed brothers and sisters or wanted anyone else. But since he cast me off, I'll be hanged if I don't feel as forlorn as old Robinson Crusoe must have felt before his man Friday turned up. This burst of confidence confirmed Rose in her purpose of winning Charlie's mentor back to him. But she said no more, contented to have done so well. They parted excellent friends, and Prince went home, wondering why a fellow didn't mind saying things to a girl or woman, which he would die before he would own to another fellow. Rose also had some sage reflections upon the subject, and fell asleep thinking that there was a great many curious things in this world and feeling that she was beginning to find out some of them. Next day, she trudged up the hill to see Archie, and having told him as much as she thought best about her talk with Charlie, begged him to forget and forgive their differences. I've been thinking that perhaps I ought to, though I am in the right. I'm no end fond of Charlie, and he's the best-hearted lad alive but he can't say no and that will play the mischief with him if he does not take care, said Archie in his grave, kind way. While father was home, I was very busy with him, so Prince got into a set I don't like. They try to be fast and think it's manly, and they flatter him and lead him on to do all sorts of things, play for money and bet and loaf about. I hate to have him do so, and tried to stop it, but went to work the wrong way, so we got into a dreadful mess. He is all ready to make up if you don't say much, for he owned to me he was wrong, but I don't think he will own it to you in words, began Rose. I don't care for that, if he'll just drop those rowdies and come back, I'll hold my tongue and not preach. I wonder if he owes those fellows money and so doesn't like to break off till he can pay it. I hope not, but don't dare to ask, though perhaps Steve knows. He's always after Prince. More's the pity. And Archie looked anxious. I think Steve does know, for he talked about debts of honour the day I gave him. There Rose stopped short and turned scarlet but Archie ordered her to fess and had the whole story in five minutes, for none dared disobey the chief. He completed her affliction by putting a five-dollar bill into her pocket, looking both indignant and resolute as he said, Never do so again, but send Steve to me if he is afraid to go to his father. Charlie had nothing to do with that. He wouldn't borrow a penny off a girl, don't think it but that's the harm he does Steve, who adores him and tries to be like him in all things. Don't say a word, I'll make it all right, and no one shall blame you. Oh me, I always make trouble by trying to help and then letting out the wrong thing, sighed Rose, much depressed by her slip of the tongue. Archie comforted her with a novel remark that it was always best to tell the truth and made her quite cheerful by promising to heal the breach with Charlie as soon as possible. He kept his word so well that the very next afternoon, as Rose looked out of the window, she beheld the joyful spectacle of Archie and Prince 
coming up the avenue arm in arm, as of old, talking away as if to make up for the unhappy silence of the past weeks. Rose dropped her work, hurried to the door, and opening it wide, stood there smiling down upon them so happily that the faces of the lads brightened as they ran up the steps, eager to show that all was well with them. Here's our little peacemaker, said Archie, shaking hands with vigour. But Charlie added, with a look that made Rose very proud and happy, and my little sister. Chapter 24 Witch Uncle, I have discovered what girls are made for, said Rose, the day after the reconciliation of Archie and the Prince. Well, my dear, what is it? asked Dr. Alec, who was planking the deck as he called his daily promenade up and down the hall. To take care of boys, answered Rose, quite beaming with satisfaction as she spoke. Phoebe laughed when I told her, and said she thought girls had better learn to take care of themselves first. But that's because she hasn't got seven boy cousins as I have. She is right nevertheless, Rosie, and so are you, for the two things go together. And in helping seven lads, you are unconsciously doing much to improve one lass, said Dr. Alec, stopping to nod and smile at the bright-faced figure resting on the old bamboo chair after a lively game of battle door and shuttlecock, in place of the run which a storm prevented. Am I? I'm glad of that. But really, Uncle, I do feel as if I must take care of the boys, for they come to join me in all sorts of troubles and ask advice, and I like it so much. Only... I don't always know what to do, and I'm going to consult you privately, and then surprise them with my wisdom. All right, my dear, what's the first worry? I see you have something on your little mind, so come and tell Uncle. Rose put her arm in his, and pacing to and fro, told him all about Charlie, asking what she could do to keep him straight and be a real sister to him. Could you make up your mind and go stay with Aunt Clara a month? asked the doctor when she ended. Yes, sir, but I shouldn't like it. Do you really want me to go? The best cure for Charlie is a daily dose of rose water. Or rose and water. Will you go and see that he takes it? laughed Dr. Alec. You mean that if I'm there and try to make it pleasant... He will stay at home and keep out of mischief. Exactly. But could I make it pleasant? He would want the boys. No danger, but he'd have the boys, for they swarm after you like bees after their queen. Haven't you found that out? Hunt Plan often says they never used to be here half so much before I came, but I never thought I made the difference. It seems so natural to have them round. Little Modesty doesn't know what a magnet she is, but she will find out some day. And the doctor softly stroked the cheek that had grown rosy with pleasure at the thought of being so much loved. Now you see, if I move the magnet to Aunt Clara's, the lads will go there as sure as I am to steal, and Charlie will be so happy at home, he won't care for these mischievous mates of his, I hope, added the doctor well knowing how hard it was to wean a 17-year-old boy from his first taste of what he's called seeing life. I'll go, Uncle, right away. Aunt Clara is always asking me and will be glad to get me. I shall have to dress and dine late and see lots of company and be very fashionable, but I'll try not to let it hurt me, and if I get in a puzzle or worry about anything... I can run to you, answered Rose, goodwill conquering timidity. So it was decided, and without saying much about the real reason for this visit, Rose was transplanted to Aunt Clara's, 
feeling that she had a work to do. Dr Alec was right about the bees, for the boys did follow their queen and astonished Aunt Clara by their sudden showing up in making calls, dropping into dinner and getting up evening frolics. Charlie was a devoted host and tried to show his gratitude by being very kind to his little sister, for he guessed why she came and his heart was touched by her artless endeavours to help him be good. Rose often longed to be back in the old house, with the simpler pleasures and more useful duties of the life there. But having made up her mind, in spite of Phoebe, that girls were made to take care of boys, her motherly little soul found much to enjoy in the new task she had undertaken. It was a pretty sight to see the one earnest, sweet-faced girl among the flock of tall lads trying to understand to help and please them with a patient affection that worked many a small miracle unperceived. The trial worked so well that when the month was over, Mac and Steve demanded a visit in their turn, and Rose went feeling that she would like to hear grim Aunt Jane say as Aunt Clara did at parting, I wish I could keep you all my life, dear. After Mac and Steve had their turn, Archie and company bore her away for some weeks, and with them she was so happy that she felt as if she would like to stay forever, if she could have Uncle Alec also. Of course Aunt Myra could not be neglected, and with secret despair, Rose went to the mausoleum, as the boys called her gloomy abode. Fortunately, she was very near home, and Dr Alec dropped in so often that her visit was far less dismal than she expected. Between them, they actually made Aunt Myra laugh heartily more than once, and Rose did her so much good by letting in the sunshine singing about the silent house, cooking wholesome messes and amusing the old lady with funny little lectures on physiology that she forgot to take her pills and gave up mum's elixir because she slept so well after the long walks and drives she was beguiled into taking that she needed no narcotic. So the winter flew rapidly away and it was May before Rose was fairly settled again at home. Dr Alec rejoiced greatly over his recovered treasure, but as the time drew near when his year of experiment ended, he had many a secret fear that Rose might like to make her home for the next twelve months with Aunt Jessie, or even Aunt Clara for Charlie's sake. He said nothing, but waited with much anxiety for the day when the matter should be decided. And while he waited, he did his best to finish as far as possible the task he had begun so well. Rose was very happy now, being out early all day enjoying the beautiful awakening of the world. For spring came bright and early, as if anxious to do its part. No one remembered the date of the eventful conversation which resulted in the doctor's experiment. No one but himself at least. So when the aunts were invited to tea one Saturday, they came quite unsuspiciously and were all sitting together having a social chat when Brother Alec entered with two photographs in his hand. Do you remember that? He said, showing one to Aunt Clara, who happened to be the nearest. Yes, indeed. It is very like her when she came. Quite her sad, unchildlike expression and thin little face. The picture was passed around, and all agreed that he was very like Rose a year ago. This point being settled, the doctor showed the second picture, which was received with great approbation and pronounced a charming likeness. It certainly was, and a striking contrast to the first one. For it was a blooming, smiling face, full of girlish spirit and health, 
with no sign of melancholy, though the softer eyes were thoughtful, and the lines about the lips betrayed a sensitive nature. Dr Alex set both photographs on the chimney piece, and falling back a step or two, surveyed them with infinite satisfaction for several minutes, then wheeled round saying briefly as he pointed to the two faces, Time is up. How do you think my experiment has succeeded, ladies? Bless me, so it is, cried Aunt Plenty, dropping a stitch in her surprise. Beautifully, dear, answered Aunt Peace, smiling entire approval. She certainly has improved, but appearances are deceitful, and she has no constitution to build upon, croaked Aunt Myra. I am willing to allow that, as far as mere health goes, the experiment is a success, graciously observed Aunt Jane, unable to forget Rose's kindness to her Mac. So am I, and I'll go further, for I really do believe Alec has done wonders for the child. She will be a beauty in two or three years, added Aunt Clara, feeling she could say nothing better than that. I always knew he would succeed, and I'm so glad you all allow it, for he deserves more credit than you know, and more praise than he will ever get, cried Aunt Jessie, clapping her hands with an enthusiasm that caused Jamie's little red stocking to wave like a triumphant banner in the air. Dr Alec made them a splendid bow, looking much gratified, and then said soberly, Thank you. Now the question is, shall I go on? This is only the beginning. None of you know the hindrances I've had, the mistakes I've made, the study I've given the case, and the anxiety I've often felt. Sister Myra is right in one thing. Rose is a delicate creature, quick to flourish in the sunshine, and as quick to droop without it. She has no special weakness, but inherits her mother's sensitive nature and needs the wisest, tenderest care to keep a very ardent little soul from wearing out a finely organised little body. I think I have found the right treatment, and with you to help me, I believe we may build up a lovely and a noble woman who will be a pride and comfort to us all. There Dr. Alex stopped to get his breath, for he had spoken very earnestly, and his voice got a little husky over the last words. A gentle murmur from the aunts seemed to encourage him, and he went on with an engaging smile, for the good man was slyly trying to win all the ladies to vote for him when the time came. Now I don't wish to be selfish or arbitrary, because I am her guardian, and I shall leave Rose free to choose for herself. We all want her, and if she likes to make her home with any of you rather than with me, she shall do so. In fact, I encouraged her visits last winter, that she might see what we can all offer her, and judge where she will be happiest. Is not that the fairest way? Will you agree to abide by her choice as I do? Yes, we will, said all the aunts, in rather a flutter of excitement at the prospect of having Rose for a whole year. Good, she will be here directly, and then we will settle the question for another year, a most important year, mind you, for she has got a good start and will blossom rapidly now if all goes well with her. So I beg of you, don't undo my work, but deal very wisely and gently with my little girl, for if any harm came to her, I think it would break my heart. As he spoke, Dr Alec turned his back abruptly and affected to be examining the pictures again. But the aunts understood how dear the child was to the solitary man who had loved her mother years ago and who now found his happiness in cherishing the little Rose who was so like her. The good ladies nodded and sighed, and telegraphed to one another 
that none of them would complain if not chosen. Just then, a pleasant sound of happy voices came up from the garden, and smiles broke out on all the serious faces. Dr. Alec turned at once, saying as he threw his head, There she is, now for it. The cousins had been a maying, and soon came flocking in, laden with the spoils. Here is our bonny Scotch rose with all her thorns about her, said Dr. Alec, surveying her with unusual pride and tenderness, as she went to show Aunt Peace her basket full of early flowers, fresh leaves and curious lichens. Leave your clutter in the hall, boys, and sit quietly down if you choose to stop here, for we are busy, said Aunt Plenty, shaking her finger at the turbulent clan who were bubbling over with the jolly born of spring sunshine and healthy exercise. Of course we choose to stay, wouldn't miss our Saturday high tea for anything, said the chief, as he restored among his men with a nod, a word, and an occasional shake. What is up, a court-martial? asked Charlie, looking at the assembled ladies with affected awe and real curiosity for their faces betrayed that some interesting business was afloat. Dr. Alec explained in a few words, which he made as brief and calm as he could, but the effect was exciting, nevertheless, for each of the lads began at once to bribe, entice, and wheedle our cousin to choose his home. You really ought to come to us, for mother's sake, as a relish, you know for she must be perfectly satiated with boys, began Archie, using the strongest argument he could think of at the moment. Ho oh, do, we'll never slam or bounce at you or call you Frady Cat, if you only will, besought Geordie and Will, distorting their countenances in the attempt to smile with overpowering sweetness. And I'll always wash my hands for I touch you, and you shall be my dolly. "'cause Pokey's gone away, and I'll love you hard,' cried Jamie, clinging to her with his chubby face full of affection. Brothers and sisters ought to live together, especially when the brother needs someone to make home pleasant for him, added Charlie, with the wheedlesome tone and look that Rose always found so difficult to resist. You had her longest, and it's our turn now. Mac needs her more than you do, Prince, for she's the light of his eyes, he says. Come, Rose, choose us, and I'll never use the musky pomade you hate again as long as I live, said Steve, with his most killing air, as he offered his cousin this noble sacrifice. Mac peered wistfully over his goggles, saying in an unusually wide-awake and earnest way, Do, cousin, then we can study chemistry together. My experiments don't blow up very often now, and the gases aren't at all bad when you get used to them. Rose, meantime, had stood quite still, with the flowers dropping from her hands as her eyes went from one eager face to another while smiles rippled over her own at the various enticements offered her. During the laugh that followed Mac's handsome proposition, she looked at her uncle, whose eyes were fixed on her, with an expression of love that went right to her heart. Ah yes, she thought, he wants me most. I've often longed to give him something that he wished for very much, and now I can. So when at a sudden gesture from Aunt Peace, silence fell. Rose said slowly with a pretty colour in her cheeks and a beseeching look about the room, as if asking pardon of the boys. It's very hard to choose when everybody is so fond of me. Therefore I think I'd better go to the one who seems to need me most. No dear, the one you love the best and will be happiest with said Dr. Alec quickly, as a doleful sniff from Aunt Myra and a murmur of my sainted Caroline made Rose pause and look that way. Take time, cousin. 
don't be in a hurry to make up your mind, added Charlie, hopeful still. I don't want any time. I know who I love best, who I'm happiest with, and I choose uncle. Will he have me? cried Rose in a tone that produced a sympathetic thrill among the hearers. It was so full of tender confidence and love for the good doctor. If she really had any doubt, the look in Dr. Alec's face banished it without a word. As he opened wide his arms and she ran into them, feeling that home was there. No one spoke for a minute, and there were signs of emotion among the aunts, which warned the boys to bestir themselves before the waterworks began to play. So they took hands and began to prance about uncle and niece, singing with sudden inspiration the nursery rhyme, Ring Around a Rosy. Of course, that put an end to all sentiment, and Rosie merged laughing from Dr. Alex's arms, with the mark of a waistcoat button nicely imprinted on her left cheek. He saw it and said with a merry kiss that half effaced it, This is my ooh lamb, and I have set my mark on her, so no one can steal her away. That tickled the boys, and they set up a shout of, Uncle had a little lamb. But Rose hushed the noise by slipping into the circle and making them dance prettily, like lads and lasses round a maypole, while Phoebe coming in with fresh water for the flowers began to twitter, chirp and coo, as if all the birds of the air had come to join in the happy spring revel of the eight cousins.' 